Hi, everybody. Thanks uh, for coming out tonight. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about a, a phenomenon called creepy pasta. So, quickly, how many here have heard about creepy pasta? How many are aware of it and they've heard about it? Just a couple of hands, maybe like five people. Wow, okay, all right, awesome. This is gonna be all new for you, great. Um, go home tonight and have good arrest after you learn about this stuff. So, um, horror. So it's been around for as long as human beings have existed, but the popular culture movement of horror has been around for 150, 200 years. Some samples of some of the books up here, it's a reflection of our time. So with you know, Mary Shelley writing you know, 150 years ago, 200 years ago about the terror of science and gothic romance, all the way up to the Blair Witch Project and paranormal activity with found film footage and using technology to play in our fears. Horror's been there, but it's been a reflection of what's been going on in our conscious or subconscious and the culture. The thing about horror, the way it exists, is that in pop culture, um, the people are producing the horror, they make a book, they make a movie, they release it, and you have time to get adjusted to it. So you see Nightmare on Elm Street, number one, it's scary, you watch it a couple times with your friends, number two comes out, it's cool, three, four. By the time you get around to number five and number six, it's become average every day. So this guy here, I mean, this is Arsenio Hall from the 1980s, and he had Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th on as a guest. When that happens, you realize that your horror film is done. It's no longer a horror at that point. It's just entertainment. The thing about it is, with that model, it took years to develop the character, find out what nuances, what people like, and then they produce it. It took a while to actually get that material out there to people. So the internet's coming along, and just like with everything else, it's rapidly changing things. The great thing about what this is, is that people are now able to make their own horror stories. They put them online, and the most popular, the most succinct, the scariest ones go on and propagate, and they go off to all these corners of the internet. And then someone comes along, and they tweak it a little bit more, and they make it more scary. This phenomenon is called creepypasta. It comes from the idea of cut and paste, copy pasta, but it's all gonna do with horror. All right, so it's been around for about 10 years named, a little bit before that too, in some ways, with people trying to do scary ideas and scary stories on different corners of the internet. There's an interesting element that plays into Creepypasta 2 called ARG, A-R-G, Alternate Reality Game. That's been around, I wanna say, since 2001. There was a Steven Spielberg movie that came out called AI, Artificial Intelligence. They put the name of the AI researcher or psychologist on the poster for it, and you can go look at this online. That person was completely made up, and people said, well, why is there an AI psychologist when there's no AI? And it turns out that the marketing company made an art game where you could learn about this person and how they were helping with the psychology of existing AIs, and it blurred the line between fiction and reality. That's been used since for the last 15 years. Movie companies love doing this stuff. For The Dark Knight, you had that movie marketing company that just specializes in ARGs. What they did is they uh, put geocaches in like 25 cities across North America that the Joker had gone to and put it out there and you can get that idea of what the Joker was and what he put in there. So it's blurring the lines. Creepypasta does this very succinctly with their stories. So really quickly, some Creepypasta examples here. Uh, some of these you might have heard of if you heard of Creepypasta, Ted the Caver, Candle Cove. Candle Cove was a, started off as just a thread to scare the bejesus out of you on this forum. It was talking about a kid's show. Hey, do you remember that kid's show that came out like, you know, when I was like five or six years old and it had like these cool little puppets and every now and then they told you to go in the kitchen and get a knife and cut yourself? That type of thing. And then people would come along and go, yeah, yeah, I remember hearing about that. And there was this bit, and they keep adding to it over and over again. And that just became the story of Candle Cove, which is now on cross hundreds of different sites. Squidward suicide is an also an idea about, there's an episode that was aired once that showed Squidward committing suicide on, on SpongeBob SquarePants. And people actually got to the point of believing it to the, one of the writers had actually come out and said, you know, this doesn't actually exist whatsoever. But there's hundreds, if not thousands of these stories. And these are just three of them this is the big one, Slender Man. If you haven't heard of Creepypasta, you probably have heard of him. Show of hands, have you heard about this guy? Yeah, more people. This came from Creepypasta. So the idea is there's this super tall, you know, skeletal looking being, no face, it's got arms. Some of the stories have it with tentacles in the back. It started off that, you know, he was around little kids, the kids would disappear, and these horrible incidents has happened after that. 
started off from 2009 on a message board, just kind of come up with the craziest idea. And the fellow who won this and this propagated, this was the original thing he came up with. So just using Photoshop skills, he digitally altered a couple of photographs. You can hardly see him, but that slender man there with all these little kids standing around him and he's in the background over there too. And then he wrote this little bit of copy. That was the one that got under people's nerves. They liked it, it got bigger. And within a couple of months, there was a fellow on YouTube who started making videos about it called Marble Hornets. I think there's about 80 videos that exist right now on Marble Hornets, and it started off with this young documentary filmmaker showing, you know, here's my life, and I'm investigating a friend, I haven't seen him in a while, then he finds out his friend's missing, he gets deeper and deeper into the story, and you start seeing Slenderman appear in the background. So as, as you got further and further along, you saw his descent into madness. That took off and it helped to propagate the meme even more. Minecraft came along, they came up with the idea of the Enderman. Then you had a guy that came along and made a video game based upon Slenderman. By that point, it had a little bit of a cult status, but since it's in the public domain, or so people thought, people are coming along and now they're using it for their own games. And these games were very successful. The fellow who made these, and there's another person who made a Slenderman game too, made good money on them. They're available on Xbox and PlayStation. That's all great for entertainment. Then in 2014, these two girls stabbed a classmate. They're 12 years old, they stabbed her 19 times, claiming that they wanted to summon the Slenderman. The victim survived, she got away, survived her wounds, which was great, fantastic. But now these girls are facing up to 65 years in prison, and that got some air attention about what this creature was. What was absent is that people weren't really talking where it came from, and why it's playing upon the minds of people that are reading this stuff. What's interesting about this too, is that the rights for this character are supposedly owned by a third party and nobody wants to name who that is, which is kind of weird. But yet the material keeps coming out. There's other games that are being made and other stories. There was a feature film that was on Kickstarter that got some funding for. They're making that. This is something that I uncovered when I was doing the research for the presentation. I didn't even know about New York Times talking about a wave of suicides that's happening on an Indian reservation in America. And at least one of the victims they found proof that they were goaded or they were, Slenderman played a part in it whatsoever, what it was, whether it was a note or the case. It plays into an Indian mythology of, something, of a being called the tall man, which plays upon the fears. And they think that other suicides in the reservation might have something to do with this. There's videos that actually exist showing the kids, the young people, where they can go hang themselves that Slenderman wants you to go do this or the tall man wants to do this. This is just being posted online. So imagine that you're a young person, maybe, you know, you have a moment of depression or whatever the case is, you're online, you're seeing this stuff happen, and it's telling you that this thing's existing. It's playing upon the, the alternate reality concept even further. And for people that are vulnerable to that, that's a dangerous combination. So just some more examples of things that are happening in creepy past right now. There's, I lost count after 50, the number of stories that filmmakers have come along and are doing really, really good, high quality videos that are showing these stories. One of the ones I really like was up there in the top left-hand corner called Weirdo, which is the idea of these kids go camping, and there's this being that's like a skinwalker that comes along, takes the shape of one of them, and, and they, they comes into the group, but they can't really tell that there's this other person there for whatever reason. It plays upon the fear of, of, of something dangerous around you. This image down here in the corner, this is another popular one from Jeff the Killer creepypasta story, but there's another element that may or may not, may not be true, that the actual image came from a person who was a suicide victim. So that plays along even further and blurs the line about, well, you know, where did this come from? Is it actually a creepy image from somebody who did kill themselves or is it just a creepy image and someone's just coming up with that story to make it even sound more sinister? So as creepypasta gets more and more popular, there's more and more outlets, more and more sites out there that are compiling the stories and they're encouraging people to get involved with it and contribute, contribute their own creepypastas. One of the ones I really like, scpwiki.net. There's over 3,000 entries in there. So the idea behind this is that there's this group that goes out, secures, contains, and protects humanity from these places, beings, whatever the case is, that can cause you know, great physical damage. Everybody can contribute to this. You can put your own story on there, and then people will come along and comment on it, and then you can improve it and make it even better. 
it's kind of like Pringles, where you can't just eat one of these things. If you read like one or two or three or four, you're going to be up there the whole night. And there's some amazing, amazing, creepy, creepy stories on there. These two right here are two of my favorites. This is actually up, up here in the corner, this giant baby that's deformed. It's actually a real art sculpture that a Japanese artist made for an installation. Somebody came across it on Wikipedia and said, I can make a story about this thing. And they did it, and they came up with this thing that if you see it and you look away, it gets you. So the whole idea is don't even look at it. This one right here is fantastic. Um, the idea is that there's a haunted stairwell, and there's a voice coming from the darkness that sounds like a little kid, and it's crying, and it's asking you to help them. So they send people down the stairwell, and eventually they see a face, and they get scared to death. And there's actually a game that was based upon this. So people are coming along, and they're taking the SCPs, designers, video, any video game designers, and they're making games based upon these things, and they're making money from them. So it's a rapid way of finding out what works. And if you see an SCP that's very popular, make a game around it, put it on Xbox, uh, Steam, and then get some cash from it. This one also, too, is kind of an interesting one. The creepy past idea is it goes back, there was a video game back in the 1980s on the NES where, remember playing that game and Godzilla was in there and you're fighting all the monsters and it kind of glitches the screen and then it says, are you scared? And then you get deeper and deeper into the game and there was an eyeball level and all these weird Lovecraftian things start happening. So this was just a creepy past that came around in 2011. The person's actually making a game from this right now and they're gonna release it and they're using the screenshots that were used on the original creepy past to, to come up with the artwork for the game. Five Nights at Freddy's, who's heard of this? Yeah, more people. So, extremely popular game with, I would say, pre-teens, little kids, stuff like that. Indie a game creator comes up with it. Hey, actually, he was making Christian-themed games, and the feedback he got was the games were scary. They're not even fun at all. So imagine a Christian-themed game that scares the hell out of you from the way it looks. So he took that feedback, and he made an actual horror game. It's like in a Chuck E. Cheese environment, and you're the security guard for the night, and these animatronic bears come out to you, and they do jump scares and scare the crap out of you when they come out like that. Extremely popular. There's been four releases. He's a millionaire from all this stuff. The movie rights were acquired by Warner Brothers. In a couple of years, it's going to star like Ryan Reynolds or something like that, so keep the eye out for that. Channel Zero is another uh, creepy pasta that's in development by sci-fi. This stuff is all happening in the last 12 months. So the Hollywood's kind of looking at this and going, wow, they're prototyping ideas. Let's use the ones that are most popular, get our own money from it. So this is in development of sci-fi. The first season, it's kind of like American horror uh, story, if you know what that program's like. So every season is supposed to be a different telling of a creepy pasta. The first one they're doing is the Candle Cove idea, so the one about the haunted uh, kids show that you watched as a kid. They got a whole idea about that. So the fellow who's writing and producing this show, he's actually written for the SCP, and he's put stories on there. And he's only identified themselves with one, but he says he has several on there. So he's a fan of the genre, and he's contributing material to that stuff already. OK, so something's happening here, and, and it's, it's getting popular. One of the things I, I, that fascinates me from this, I've always been interested in games, always been interested in horror. But I have three kids, uh, 13, 11, and 6. And so my oldest is just one in the highest school, and the other two are, are uh, in elementary school. And their friends know about this stuff. They watch the videos. They want to play games at recess. Let's play Slenderman. I'm like, really? Really? That's what's going on? But kids know about this stuff for whatever reason. It's interesting to them. So what is it? What are the reasons for this? So some of the stuff that's being talked about, I mean, it's a modern day equivalent of a ghost story. Everybody wants to be scared. This is the digital form of it. You can go into a message forum, you can read this stuff, it unnerves you, and there's another one right around the corner, you can read another story or follow a link. Uh, the rapid prototyping, I think that's a key element of it too. You put stuff out there, you get immediate feedback, people tell you, I really like this aspect of it, this one didn't do so much. Someone comes along and says, what if you tweak this a little bit? You incorporate that into your creepypasta. The next thing you know, people like it even more. Someone comes along, and then they say, well, actually, it's based on a real story. And then you don't even know where the line is anymore between fiction and reality. The immersive element, too, that plays into it. The alternate reality game aspect, I think, is, is essential to this. Um, the creepypastas that I've read, they could, you know, there's some with a supernatural element, but they also start out in the world of the real. And they really build up the idea that this could be a real thing that could happen to you, whatever the case is. They're very compelling in that. And that definitely plays into the ARG um, genre. 
And then the other thing too is it's the generation thing. This is something that's new and you know the younger generation are looking at it. This is ours just as 30 years ago. Um, Freddy Krueger, uh, Michael Myers, the slasher films of the 80s were from that generation. And before that, the 1950 movies, the B movies, and before that, so on and so forth, the Penny Dreadfuls. But where is this thing going? So I didn't want to come up here and I don't want to talk about fear-mongering of this stuff because I don't necessarily believe that that is a legitimate play on this. I'm old enough that I remember back in the 1980s when people were playing Dungeons and Dragons and there were kids that came along and said Dungeons and Dragons caused you know, my friend to kill himself and a note was left behind. And there was, a big, uh, there was a lot of talk on the nightly news that is Dungeons and Dragons affecting the mindset of youth? Is it causing them to hurt themselves? Just as a couple years before, it was also talk about you know, heavy metal music. It's the work of Satan. You play it backwards and it's gonna tell you to kill your family and everything else. I think that stuff is, is people that are looking for an answer. I think maybe Creepypasta might take it a step further because it, it tries to blur the line. And maybe with D&D &D and the music, it was more clear to see. But now with the nature of the internet and the fact that we're all cocooning and getting so involved in our online worlds, it might make it easier to prey upon the mind of people. And then looking ahead with VR and AR, I mean, imagine what creepypasta is going to be like in, say, 10 years from now, when you're wearing Microsoft HoloLens and you're sitting up here with my glasses, and all of a sudden something jumps out and scares the shit out of me. You know, What happens at that point there when you're so immersed in that story that you think it's real life and someone else is in control of it? That could be a real danger. OK, so that's about it. I wanted to get through this quick. I had 18 slides here. Uh, I recommend if you're interested about this stuff at all, go online, type in creepypasta, or go to scp.net. Like I said, they're like Pringles. You can't eat one of those things, and they're tons of fun. And um, yeah, well, I'll take it for any questions. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, <laughs> when he described it to me, it was not really as scary as that really, really was. I'm actually slightly worried. Um, is there any questions in the crowd for Patrick at all? Everyone's too scared to ask questions. Okay. What's your favorite Oh yeah. Okay. Good question. So I really, I really like the SCP Wikipedia. I think there's a lot of creativity in there. Um, there's an awesome one about Cain and Abel, and they don't name them as Cain and Abel. They're just these, you know, you can't kill these things whatsoever. And if they get loose, the world is over. That type of stuff. I love that idea. I love the haunted stairwell. It's just a wonderful idea. One of the cool things about the haunted stairwell is that when this SCP group came along and they identified it was haunted and it killed people, they would take um, um, uh, death row prisoners and use them as test subjects and wire them up. So you could read the transcripts of them going down the stairwell and just walking down and hearing their story about what's going on. I think that's a really cool idea. Um, I like that stuff. The videos as well, the weirdo video, uh, it's on Vimeo. I would recommend watch that if you want to stay up for an hour or so afterwards. That's a good idea. Um, there's a lot out there. I mean, it, it, there's that caver idea, the, 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 the photograph of the person that's trapped in the confined space and they feel something behind them. I don't even want to go in caves. <laughs> it's just one of those things I just don't want to do. There's a creepy past out there for everybody, but those are some of my ones I really like. Any more questions? One at the front, Dan. So, you say that these things can be created by multiple people collaborating, right? So, for example, when you say that the right get sold to a, a news channel or a TV, who gets, who do they buy the rights from? Uh, if you don't establish that you are the owner, it's available in the public domain. Everything on SCP, the Wikipedia for there, you can go off and you can create your own game, you can create your own television series, you can create your own comic book, it does not matter. And the profit is yours to take. Um, the only thing, it's, it's under a Creative Commons license too. The other aspect is if you create something, people can also contribute to that and grow in that too. But that's just like War of the Worlds. War of the Worlds is in public domain now, so people are using it and modifying it, doing their own stories about it. So it's kind of like that. Um, with the Slenderman issue, it's a little bit more in the gray because people assumed it was in public domain and they were going off and creating things and people have come along and established that. The creator of uh, the character says that the film, television, movie rights are held by somebody else. He licensed it to that person, but that person's never been identified. And I don't know if that's playing into the ARG element or not because people keep making these games, people keep making their projects. 
nothing really does to, to stop them. So. Okay, I think uh, we should all thank Patrick Sorio. All right, thanks. Yeah.